In fact, one of our earliest clocks was Stonehenge. It's a little bit big, you wouldn't want to carry it around on your wrist, and it's not exactly very accurate. But it's actually a form of sundial. The sundial is really quite a simple device. Sundial just consists of a plate with some markings on for the hours. And there's a pointer here. And as the sun moves across the sky, so the shadow of the pointer moves across the dial. It flows around the dial, like time itself. But what happens on a cloudy day? Sundial isn't very useful. So people started to think, what else flows like time? Instead of using heavenly bodies to measure time, what other things are around on the earth that will enable us to measure time? And they came up with things like this. Well, this is an hourglass, I'm sure a lot of you have seen one before. And it's very simple. Sand flows from one container to another. But again, it's not exactly very accurate. And then there's water. Well, that flows. And in fact, water clocks became very important for measuring time. And here, we've got a mock-up of one. Not exactly the thing will go on your mantelpiece. But before I show you, I want to do a demonstration. Because I want to test out some of these different ways of measuring time. And for this, I need two volunteers. Would you two like to, to come down? What's your name? Ben. Ben. You're in charge of the hourglass, Ben. You come over here. And your name is? Dominic. Dominic. Dominic, you've only got your own head to judge time with, OK? And what we're going to do is we're going to put on a blindfold. Because what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and judge a minute. So, Dominic, you tell me if this is, is this tight enough? Yep. Yeah? Still breathe? <laughs> OK. So you stand here, Dominic, and Ben, when I, when I say now, you're going to both try and judge a minute. So, Dominic, you've got to count to yourself. One minute. And this is a, this is, well, it's supposed to be a one minute timer. So all you have to do is turn it over. But I want you to shout out when you think a minute's passed. Okay? I'm going to go over on the water clock. And was, this water clock has actually got a kind of primitive alarm attached to it. And it's going to tell us when the water clock thinks a minute's passed. So I've got a button here, which is I have to turn on to start the flow of the water. So when I say now, we all try to judge a minute, OK? So three, two, one, now. Now while this is going, I'll just explain to you. All OK? Right? Just explain to you what's going on with the water clock. It's very simple. There's a supply of water goes through to a constant head tank, which provides constant pressure, and therefore constant flow of water down into this cylinder. Cylinder gradually fills up with water and there's a float in there. And the float is connected to a rod which has some markings on. And the markings move against the arrow and allow us to judge the passing of time. They used to use these water clocks to wake up the bell ringers in churches for the prayers that started before the sun came up. So they're really quite useful devices. Finish. Oh, right, OK. How are you getting on, Dominic? I'm just coming up to a minute. Oh, you're just coming up for a minute? OK, well, I'm a little bit... Stop! OK, right. Fine, so you both finished, well... There we go. Poor Dominic's over here, stuck with the blindfold, so let's take this off him. Thank you very, very much. So what we saw here were three different ways of measuring time. 
probably three of the best ways of measuring time at the beginning of this millennium. And although one was much more elaborate than the others, it certainly doesn't mean it's more accurate. <laughs> and so this was a problem. Because imagine, in a town where bells are going to be rung according to one of these clocks. In fact, likelihood is there are different clocks, of course, in different churches that are going to ring bells. So I think we can begin to imagine what that must have sounded like. In fact, it was King Charles V of France who first noticed this problem because around midday there'd be bells ringing for one hour either side and he got awful headaches and he just couldn't stand the noise. Okay, that's it. Finish. So he said, no more. I'm going to make every clock in Paris synchronized to palace time. And that is one of the first reported cases of synchronization in a town. But we also saw the problem that having things that flow like time doesn't necessarily mean that they're good clocks. In fact, it wasn't until Galileo, a 19-year-old, sitting in Pisa Cathedral, looking up at the chandelier swinging back and forth. He was a medical student, so he decided to check it with his pulse. What he found was, it really was a regular motion. And that gave him an idea. Instead of measuring time by something flowing, measure time by counting the number of swings. This led to the development of the pendulum clock. And we have one here. It's a very simple device. There's a weight which falls under gravity and it sets the pendulum swinging. And a given number of swings corresponds to a given unit of time. Now these pendulum clocks became the main clocks for hundreds of years. So that's it. It seems to solve a problem about measuring time. But it didn't. Because if you were at sea, some nasty things could happen. Here I have another pendulum clock. Let's imagine that we've taken one on a ship. And we're going off, pulling out of the port. It's a very calm day, so the pendulum swing quite happily. And we get out into the open sea. Things get a little bit nastier. The wind picks up and bang. Suddenly, we've lost our accurate measure of time. Why do we care? If you're at sea, who cares what time it is? But the important point is, it turned out that time wasn't just important at sea for measuring when it was, it was also important for measuring where you were. Time was the key to position. Let's have a look at this. Let's imagine we're in the middle of the Atlantic. It turns out what you need, really, are two measurements. You need something called latitude, which is the angle up from the equator, that's actually easy to measure, because you can just look up at the pole star. But then there's longitude. Now that's a completely different thing, because imagine that we're somewhere on the equator. The equator's a circle. How do you tell where you are on a circle? A circle has no beginning, and a circle has no end. Well, time was the crucial aspect here, because people realized if they took an accurate clock from their home port and carried it with them. That was, it was set to the time of their home port. 